Hello, everybody. Okay. Hope you are not so tired, but that you should be tired. Yeah. But um, for the rest of this morning and this uh, early afternoon, I will try to give you. This is the actual topic, the name of the topic, the real one, the one that you have over in the in the program will come later. But the, I will try to talk about many things related to water in different things from from the typical geomorphological point of view towards the social part of the issue. So it's going to be basically a popularity eh, of many things. I, in some cases, I could talk uh, a whole day of in, on one single th slide, but it's going to be very difficult to provide you all the details of everything that I can provide you, I, I can talk to you today. <clears throat> but basically, uh, I have some uh, comments regarding this presentation in the sense, uh, basically one is this, uh, a lot of uh, issues could be very simple for many of you, but for others, like maybe some, some physical processes or, or geomorphological processes, many of you already know that but maybe the lawyers doesn't know that. And for those that uh, uh, are more in the natural science probably don't know too much about the social processes. So, so f I, I will not be too deep probably, but uh, I will be just trying to cover all different kind of aspects of this issue. Okay, that would be the best. I'm, uh, there you have my name. I came from Argentina, from Bahia Blanca, which is south of Buenos Aires. Eh? There's nothing, not, and uh, I hope that when you finish today this, this talk, you know that uh, Argentina is more than Buenos Aires and Messi. <laughs> no? So we can have, because yesterday somebody told me that Argentina was Messi. I think I, I hear you see <laughs> I don't even like soccer, so it's a problem. <laughs> okay, uh, and I'm a kind of a very strange scientist in the sense uh, I started to study physics. Uh, then uh, I realized that I didn't like to be in a lab, so I became a geologist, and then discovered oceanography, and I have been uh, playing as an oceanographer, because oceanography for me is a hobby, no? And that's part of my, uh, I, I, have, I have a kind of sign in my office that it says that uh, I like this job so much that I will do it by free. <laughs> the problem is that they also know that. <laughs> so that's the kind of things. Uh, and uh, so I will try to talk about my, my hobby. Then for, for many years, I was doing mostly natural science, with in quotes, uh, in oceanography. And, uh, and I couldn't talk a, a biologist with the, with the point of a, of a pole. So I didn't want to work with a biologist at, at all. Then uh, back in 89, I started a project. We worked a project in Canada where we were something like 30 people for a month working in a tidal flood with a lot of biologists. And I really learned that I couldn't understand the place without a biologist on my side. So, and then I started to work in physical biological interactions processes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and about 10, 15 years ago, uh, we started several projects in which uh, people became important. Then, uh, in our group, we start to have economists, anthropologists, sociologists. And we started to understand that people were not only the, the real recipients of our research, but also they were the source of our data. And so we started to work with, with people. So I will talk with you about natural processes, physical processes, physical biological interactions, and then 
what, what we do with the people. So I'm trying to try to cover all these things. I uh, hope it's going to be as clear as possible. No? And, well, you see, let me ask you a question. How many of you have gone uh, to a beach? All of you. Okay. So you look at a beach. Yeah? That's good. That's fine. How many of you have seen a lake? Yeah? Yeah. So you have seen, you have looked at a lake. Yeah? How many of you have seen a river, have looked at a river? Yeah? Okay. So everybody has done those kind of things. Let me get back. How many of you have seen a beach? Actually seen a beach. Like, for example, how is the sediment there? How are the waves coming in that beach? Eh? How are the, the, the people affecting that beach? That is seeing the beach. <coughs> it's completely different than going to, the look, to look at the beach and sitting, looking the inside of your of eyelids. Eh? Because most of you don't go to do that. Eh? But I, I try to sit down, because the beach is the hobby of my hobby. Eh? So I, I go to play in the beaches. Then I work in lakes. So I try to see the lake. How big is it? How deep? Eh? What is the effect of the, of the salinity on the, on the fishes? Eh? How the phytoplankton works over there? Those kind of things are important, and you have to see them. Rather, so it's observation, monitoring, like you were saying, the professor uh, that was talking before me, uh, it's, a, it's a major issue that we have to really play uh, specific in these places. Then, you have seen the river. How many of you have seen the river? Yes. Eh? Then, have you seen this? Let me see what you see there. Yeah. No, it's uh, the Correntoso River in near Bariloche. Eh? What do you see there? Eh? You, you see, well, I will do, Charlie, because I will not finish it ever. No? But what happens is you see the river going up and river going down, uh, upstream. So not all the rivers go downstream. There are part of the rivers that go upstream. So those are the kind of things you have to think this, all the natural processes are extremely complex. And it's very difficult to see, to know everything over there. So that's, that we have to really be careful and think what we are seeing in those places. What is our observation in this environment? Well, that's the formal title of my talk. And I don't know, Tercio was really very good to me because he wanted to me to talk from the continent, continental stuff to the marine stuff. This is going to be a mess. So that's a reason this, this is very complicated. Then what happened? Rains eh, fall on top of the mountains. The water will, will uh, get together through little streams and then will connect to a main river. Finally, this water goes to the sea. Eh? So that's bas the basic part of this uh, water cycle eh, that we are looking always. No? Then what happened is uh, we might have a, a lake in the middle, a reservoir, so something that will change completely this cycle. The water is not directly going to the sea, but it's going to be stopped in some place. Maybe uh, human intervention or a natural process. But we have to think about that. Then you, we have the, the agriculture that goes over there. When you are looking into the uh, water uh, actually reaching the sea, eh, less than 30% of the water that rains in the mountains actually reach the sea. Most of the water is being retained in the continent. So for different reasons. Then, for example, you have tourists. Also, it's another activity that you normally have in, the, in some parts of the, of the system. And then you might have industries around this 
uh, these uh, places, and then you have the beach where it's also it's been affected by how much water and sediment is being provided by the river into the coast. But all of these things has to be integrated into the basin. And it's not only the natural stuff that goes on, goes on over there, but also how we do with the human intervention into these uh, river basins, eh, which includes the marine part. So the river basin, the river is not an isolated stuff within the, basic on the, on the marine stuff, uh, marine processes, because this has to be related with this concept, which is the ecological flow, of, of what is now the e-flow. Eh? You have here mostly a uh, definition that you have for this. This is the, the amount of water that we need to supply from one, from one place to another, so that the people downstream eh, will, will use that water also. And if we retain that water, so there's a number of dams that were made eh, along the years, since 19, the, the uh, middle of 19th century until 2009. This. So you see how much has been growing and growing, and see in South America, for example, it started in the 30s. But look at how many you have over there. Eh? Do you know how many dams there are? Just give me a number. Dams, uh, all type of dams. Eh? Eh? 10,000. 10, That's a good, uh, good number. Somebody else want to provide another number? Approximately 8,000. Uh, 8,000. Yeah. Another to want to, to give us? Eh? There is two million dams. Only fifty thousand are over ten square kilometers in area. Just to give you an idea of how mass how massive is our intervention in the rivers in the world. And those dams, what they're doing is not only retaining water, they're retaining sediment and retaining nutrients and everything that is goes that is not going downstream from that place. No? So that's, that's a major impact that we are doing in, in, on our river system. We'll go back to this later. Then let me give you an extremely brief idea of the main uh, environments we are going to deal in different, different places. So you have uh, which are the ecosystems that we are going to consider? Well, you have glaciers. That's the one of them. Just I'm going to show you some examples, nothing, nothing in detail. Eh? Rivers, eh? deltas, lakes, and continental wetlands. This is this is, I, I took about uh, a month ago, about 4,000 meters in the, in Colombia, near Lake Tota. This is a beautiful, pristine paramo. Very good, very nice. This is a continental wetland, for example. You have also the coasts. You have cliffy coasts, beaches. Well, what the people think this uh, is, a, is, a, is a beach. It's, it's, the beach is whatever is behind all those people, <laughs> underneath those people. So, so, the, so it's not the, 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 the other nice beach that we saw in the beginning. No? Uh, for example, you have different beaches. Eh? You see, this, uh, this is a beach in Portugal. Uh, the, the, the guy here is uh, the president of the American University in, in, in Dubai, no? a very good friend of mine. And this is another beach. You see different kinds of beaches, for example. Eh? Also reefs, like, uh, I, I don't remember which one is this one. OK. And then you have coastal ecosystems, like uh, coastal wetlands, like tidal flats like these ones, those are the ones I, I, I work mostly, eh? of salt marshes, hmm? mangroves, eh? freshwater, freshwater marshes. These freshwater marshes, for you that don't, don't have any experience on this, is are marshes in which you have tidal influence, but the, the water is fresh, see? And seagrasses, for example. Eh? That's another type of uh, wetland. 
And then you have estuaries. Uh, ah, well, you, 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 um, there is a lot of information on this book. There's 2009, and we are working now in the, in the second edition. So if you, you really want to have some information on what you can look for this book. Uh, estuaries. This, uh, what I'm going to present you is a classification on estuaries. I worked uh, back in 95. And uh, you have different types of uh, estuaries. Like, uh, for example, uh, primary estuaries, where primary estuaries, which is the ones you really, uh, you can see who originated that estuary. There was a river, there was a fault, uh, there was a volcano. That's the, that's the kind of primary estuary. And you have different types. Uh, coastal plains, like the Chesapeake Bay. This Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the world. Eh? It's the only one that has about 360 kilometers, the only one that contains a tidal wave within the estuary. Eh? For example, Aria. This is a, it's a, an estuary that normally is in uh, mountains or cliffy coasts, for example. Eh? This is one in, in Ireland. Uh, by fjords, for example, because you know, everybody knows what's a fjord. But probably very few people know what is a fjord, eh? which is a, is a fjord, but in, in, in a coastal plain area. It doesn't have mountains. This is the north of Sweden, for example. Tidal rivers, like the Rio de la Plata in Argentina and Uruguay, eh, which, uh, according to our governments, is not, a, an, it's not an estuary. It's a river, but scientifically it's an estuary. <laughs> <laughs> So, and you have a delta, too, over there. And you have deltas and, the, and estuaries that form here in the distributary of the deltas. There's a type of delta. And then you have a structural. A structural are the ones that were formed by, by tectonic process, like uh, faults, volcanic uh, effects, all occurring within the uh, Pleistocene or Holocene. So in the last maybe uh, 200, 300 years, 1,000 years. Yeah? And you have a, an example from the, the Chilean friends that are from Bolivia. Yeah? This is the, uh, oh, I forgot the name. Uh, it's a small estuary on the, on the north of, uh, of Bolivia. Uh, uh, it's going to come to me. This is before and after. This is a drawing of a German naturalist before and after the earthquake of 1960, eh? the Keule, Keule estuary. And you can see how it was before the, before the earthquake and after the earthquake. So big changes occur because of uh, geomorphological changes only because of a process like uh, uh, a very sharp process like uh, earthquake, a tsunami, etc. And then you have secondary estuaries como, like coastal lagoons. Yeah, you have several examples of coastal lagoons. Those are typical. And this you have get uh, this information in this book. But it's already out of print, but you can find uh, some examples. Well, one uh, important thing in which I, my, my, my work mostly relates to sediment transport, uh, which is an extremely complex uh, idea. For example, my, uh, I always tell this, uh, this story. My, uh, the, my thesis director was a very good friend of uh, Hans Albert Einstein, which was the son of Albert Einstein. He was a, like a, I will tell you, like a, if there was a Nobel Prize for sediment transport, he was the, the top guy. Actually, there's a prize a worldwide prize, the equivalent for Nobel Prize, named after his name. No? And he was telling the story that uh, when he graduated in the Technological Institute uh, in Switzerland uh, uh, from, uh, as a hydraulic engineer, uh, his father asked him what is he was going to do. And he said, well, I'm going to work in sediment transport. And the answer of his father was, oh, that's something I always wanted to do but it was too difficult. <laughs> so that's the kind of things that you can imagine. This, even though we are years working on this, we have nothing. We know nothing about sediment transport. Be, be 
But basically, everything is related to these processes. Eh? And everything is related to water. Let me ask you something. Can you think in water without a, a vessel to contain it? Just water there. Do you have any? Like donuts? Eh? Like donuts? No. Water without something that contains water. No, it's impossible. It's impossible. So water is like a, ga a gas. It will fill up the shape of the container. Yeah? That's the important thing. Then what happens is water will deform. Eh? in the shape of the container. So we are going to think that, the, or we have to think that the geomorphology of the, of the place where the water is will play a major role in whatever happens with that water. So uh, <laughs> the, the point is that the point is that you have to keep giving me mate because otherwise I'm gonna, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna die. <laughs> uh, the point is that geomorphology plays the most important role in whatever water is moving. Without that, we really, and, and it's completely different to have water flowing in a canal than water flowing in a river or water flowing in a beach. Not because of the water, it's because of the geomorphology of that place. Yeah? So some, something we really have to take uh, good care and, this, uh, and think always in this concept. Also, another problem we have to think is about the scales. Yeah? Of course, we can have completely a wide variety of scales, but in the scales that we are working, which is in the human type of level of the scale, we have to think in this kind of conditions, especially because normally we think in one type of scale, in a spatial scale or in a time scale. But actually things are in the two scales because things that happen in a, in a long term affect large areas, whereas things that happen in a very short time is mostly a local process. So we have always think in this kind of thing. Something like, uh, for example, uh, in this case of the mega scale, you are considering, for example, the length of all the coasts of South America. Hmm? So changes, if you see changes at that level, it has to happen in many, many centuries, thousands of years. So it cannot happen in, in one day or, or hours. So this is kind of change. If you then go to a small beach, eh, for example, uh, and look at that, that, that nice beach that we see at the beginning, uh, I want to see changes in that beach. Eh? For example, along uh, 100, kilo, 100 or maybe 20 kilometers of that beach. So those changes will happen in years and months. And then if we, if we want to look at beach profile, uh, and that is a question of meters, uh, changes in this, those changes will, will be produced by waves and tides that will modify the, this beach uh, profile. And that will happen in days or hours. Uh, but actually, any change on that beach will happen because a single particle of sediment was moved by a wave one centimeter to another centimeter, and those processes will happen in seconds. Um, what is going to happen for the beach profile is the uh, addition of all the movements of all those particles, uh, every second, every centimeter. Uh, and the change in that profile the, the amount of profiles along this stretch of beach will produce a change on the, on the meso, uh, macro scale of that beach. 
And all the changes that is going to happen on all the beaches along off the coast will produce a big change in the macro scale. I don't know if you really realize that actually the process that produced the big changes in the, in the cost of the war on a river occurs in a minute process, every day, every second, all the time. Hmm? That's the reason because it's so difficult. Hmm? And then you have another type of scales because processes require different kinds of things. Like, for example, they require time. Hmm? And also it's different the type when the the water is working in that place, eh, it is completely different if I, I had to pound a wave against a rock or a simple uh, sediment that is uh, lying free in the beach. So the changes that I'm gonna are gonna produce are gonna be in uh, the much larger when it's much easier to move the sediment, but it was much more complicated. It required more time. Uh, but also, this is a very interesting thing because we need a threshold. Uh, that, means, that means I have a threshold here because up beyond that, le that level, I cannot make any change because I have some kind of boundary in this concept. And um, well, this is a kind of a complex graph in which I want to go back to the geomological in, uh, in, in the, the, uh, effect. So you have an example of what happens in a beach, for example. And you have uh, winds, tides, fresh water input, and those all are going to modify the currents and the waves. And all depends, as I said before, with the geomorphology. Yeah? Then what happens is all these things impact a, a little thing of, your morph of the geomorphology over there. It will change. A, a grain of sediment will move from one place to another. Yeah? If the geomorphology was affecting the water, hmm? if I change one single grain from one, point, from one place to another, I will not have the same geomorphology anymore. It's com it will change completely everything. So if you grab that. So this is going to be a complete a cycle in which as, as, as I move sediments, I change the morphology, and the geomorphology will change me all the other processes. To, to, if, if you don't understand something or as I say something complicated, please stop me, ask me anytime. And, and that is only the physical part. Then I can have a plant over there that will change me the way the water will move. Eh? I have a biofilm that will produce me some stabilization of the sediment, eh? and the sediment will not move because I need a lot more energy to move the sediment because I have uh, these diatoms on top of the, of the sediment. So it's completely different. And sometimes if I, for the geologists going uh, back in the re geological record, see, see the strata, I don't, they don't see that there was a biofilm over there. And so they don't know what happened over there. But actually, there were some biological processes that stopped the changes in the, in the strata, for example. So this is it's important to understand what happened now so the geologists, for example, can understand what happened in the past. Then you have a lot of controlling. In fact, this was done for estuaries, but it, it happens for every environment we think. So, and these are basically a, a listing. They have no priority but whatsoever. So you can have that information. Those are the kind of things that you have to take care of. And, and some of them will be important for one side, and some of them will be important for others. Let's look at the, my computer and the system doesn't like each other. So the good thing is I get extra time. That's the real. <laughs> OK. Then, uh, so there are, there are many things. I will not go through that, but you have different type of climate, different type of coastal types, 
coastal lithology, what I was talking, hard rocks versus soft rocks, for example, uh, tidal range, uh, it's, co it's completely different in an environment if it's, the tidal range is a macro tidal that you have here in this area in Brazil, or macro tidal like we have in the south of Argentina, we have 10, 12 meter tidal range, for example. Uh, or the stability, if the coast is in uh, is the sea level, like somebody asked before, the sea level is advancing, or the sea level is retreating. There are places in the world the sea level is retreating, uh, not always is advancing, uh, or the coast is stable. Yeah? So those are the kind of things that you have to... Then you have to understand what happens with the river discharge. It's high, it's, it's low. Is the river discharge and the sediment input of the river the same thing? No, because you, have, you can have a river that actually has very little water, but has a tremendous input of, of sediment. And the other way around, rivers with tremendous amount of water, but practically no sediment input. Yeah? So it's not the same thing. Yeah? Uh, and also how are the marine diffusive, so what the, the river brings a lot of sediments in the, water, in the coast for example. And then it's fighting with the, with the waves and the, and the tides because they want to get that sediment and, and carry out someplace else. So this is a balance. The coast will, uh, will prograde or aggrade eh, depending if the, the balance, who wins the balance? Eh? Who wins the river or the marine environment? So, so that will make, will make a change in between a delta or an estuary. Yeah? That's, that's a simple thing that will change you the geomorphology of a place. Yeah? Uh, well, of course, atmospheric influence, other kind of things. Well, you have, this is a much more complex graph. I will not explain it, but you have an idea that how many complex things can go in an environment without taking into account the people. Yeah? In, in, uh, so far, we didn't put people here. Eh? And then, that's what I really want to talk This is probably one of the uh, take-home uh, message. Everything, every environment is a crash, eh? is, a, is a battle, in, in, especially in the coast, between the, what we, I call the continental energy, which is all the river, the type of sediments, the effect that sedi the, 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 the continent brings to the coast. Eh? And what happened with the marine energy? The marine energy that is going to produce the changes, will going to move the sediments around, will try to erode the coast, those kind of things. So whatever we have at the coast is going to be depending on the imbalance on these two energies. So that, that means that if the coast will retreat or the coast will advance. Yeah? It doesn't have nothing to do with sea level. Just a simple process, the local process that will happen in that place. I don't know if that, that uh, really you understand. Hmm? And then this is a very interesting graphic, a little old, 1975. But but shows you very well how the, the different conditions, for example, the effect of tides, eh, will uh, affect the type of geomorphology I will have in that place. For example, uh, in, in, in low, uh, uh, this is a microtidal uh, environment, there's a mesotidal, there's a macrotidal. The, the tidal is being divided. Less tidal range below two meters is considered a microtidal. Between two and four meters are my, uh, mesotidal, and greater than four meters are macrotidal. Actually, right now so I use, we are using another terms like uh, hypertidal for more than six meters. But, but this is a uh, old figure so it was not considered those times. You see, in in macrotidal areas where en the marine energy is low you get more continental things, hmm? like tidal deltas or barriers, uh, the fluvial deltas or barriers. Uh, and then, as you move uh, higher and higher, you start having more marine environment. Eh? 
So in a low cost area, for example, if I have a high tide, the tide will invade the, the, the area, the low, uh, the low uh, relief area will, in, will be invaded by the tides and produce this un intertidal environment. So this is a big change. This is, shows you the percentage of these environments which are around uh, cost. So that's basically, again, this relation between oceanic and continental energy, sediment supply, coastal stability, and climatic regions. Because it's different if I have a, uh, in the tropical environments, I will have some kind of uh, mangroves areas, whereas it's more common to have salt marshes in the more temperate areas, for example. Well, back again to my, to my river and show you the good th the interesting thing in this river is that to get a drop of water from this river that went through all the system back into the system eh, I need to evaporate it hmm? I will have to evaporate ah oh, that's, that's great it's, it, it, it's going to evaporate that's a good thing to be in with Argentina, if you get mate. Uruguayo. Y uno uruguayo, y uno uruguayo. Pero el mate es uruguayo. Ah, sí, eso es mate uruguayo. Es cierto. Sí, es el único thing. The Uruguayan go with the, with the mate everywhere. That's good. Well, the good thing is, so, so I, I need to get uh, this evaporation to get this water back here. And not the same particle of water will go back to that mountain. It's going to be somewhere else, probably. Eh? But now, if I look on an on a intertidal environment, I think it's the next one is what happens. Yeah. You see, for example, uh, this is a tidal, uh, a tidal uh, intertidal environment. I don't know if it's working. Yeah. You see, for example, water comes from the sea eh? and fills up the system. Uh, and then, after six hours, the system will go down and the water will go down. Yeah? So that happens every uh, 12 hours. Yeah? I will have that kind of thing. So it's a completely different thinking of what happens in a fluvial system than a marine system. So it's a completely different kind of work. Yeah? And let me show you another. O sea, me vas a filmar todo el tiempo. Vos? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then I will, have, I will be in Facebook and it will be viral. That will be that kind of thing. But I want to show you an example. This is a, this is a, is a, is a tidal channel in, my estu in the estuary of Bahia Blanca, which is a very complex place. Uh, and here is a. It's a, a river basin eh, in the in, uh, United States, which more or less likes similar to that. I so say, you look at them, they basically look like the same. See? So that's, that will show you a different, how different are these places. For example, for that uh, the river basin, so what, what I did, I just tried to make the boundary of the, of the basin. Is here, I don't have phys a physical boundary. For example, I don't have a mountain around a tidal channel because everything is completely flat. So uh, I had to think in a different way that my, my boundaries are, are hydrodynamic. And then, so I tried to, to make a kind of a, a basin similar to this one. What's the big difference? For this river, eh? The precipitation, forget this, this drainage basin. For this river, I have 200 millimeters per year. And the density of the river channels per square kilometer is four kilometers of, of, of channels per square kilometer. Yeah? Let me show you what happens there. The basin area here is only 10 square kilometers. I have a density of 40 kilometers per square kilometer. Hmm? And 
for example, you just imagine how much water I'm going over there because every day eh, I get 50 centimeters of water covering everything eh, twice a day. Eh, and along the year, the water thickness equivalent to 200 millimeters a year is 133,000 meters per year. So that basically makes the same kind of, uh, of geomorphology, but the, the processes are completely different. So when, and then we had to think what type of how each environment works in a completely different way. But another point is what are the modifications, for example, plants? Eh? The biology, I didn't talk too much about the biology. Well, biology plays an important role, for example, uh, in protecting a coast. So this is a, is a, a theoretical analysis we did a uh, few years ago. And you can see the different concepts. For example, these are sea grasses, uh, tidal flats, uh, some spartina type of, of plants, so different type of plants which ha happens at different levels on a profile along the coast. Eh? So the, what, I, what I show you here is the influence they have on the wave activity. And you can see that when, they, when you have, and the difference between what happens in low tide and what happens in high tide. So the difference is completely, so it, in, in low tide, for example, the seagrasses will act affecting basically mostly of the energy of the waves. But in high tide, the changes in the wave activity will be produced by the plants as we move higher and higher into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, in, in, in the environment. So you see plants, and the relief play a role in protecting the environment. And, and wetlands are the buffers of our coasts. They are the ones who protect us. For example, the, we have the tsunami of uh, Sumatra 2004. Uh, the areas that were basically destroyed were the areas in which people eliminated the mangroves, eh? especially to do uh, uh, aquaculture, uh, free aquaculture, and, and the big all-inclusives. Eh? Those places where they, they, later, they eliminated the, the mangroves, they were the ones who were destroyed. The, man, the first lines of the mangroves were, of course, destroyed, but the rest, everything that was behind these mangroves was completely protected. So this is a big change because we eliminated the, the plants. So this, this, that's a kind of buffer we have in this system. And that, that's, that's also how the mangroves work. For example, you have the, the, the depends against waves, of course, and also depends on how you, the tsunami will hit. It's in low tide and high tide because that depends on the structure of the plant. It's completely different to fight with a grass like a, a spartina or a mangrove. So completely different effects of the plants against a, a natural process. Yeah? Uh, also, this is another example. This is part of uh, the dissertation of a student. Uh, she gave me this uh, after an operation, just, just raised her yesterday. So just, I didn't have too much time to, to look at it. But what you are seeing is the Negro River yeah, it's not the same like uh, you have here in Brazil. It's, it's the, largest, uh, the largest river in Argentina that actually uh, is, is completely within Argentina. No, that's a real the important thing. Most, most of our rivers come from different places. No? And, uh, and you can see the changes in the geomorphology. This is the, the, the upper valley yeah, along the years. This is the, the middle valley. These changes, we believe, that's a part of the study that uh, Anna Clara is doing, 
is because of the changes in sea level that occurred about 6,000 years ago. Sea level was about 6 meters above the present sea level eh, 6,000 years ago. Eh, in Bahia Blanca, estuary was 7 meters, was the highest in all the world. Eh, 6,000 years ago is hugely higher than everything that is going to be predicted eh, for the future because of the climate change. It's going to be as much as one meter ever. Eh? Well, we have 6, 000, 6 meters in 6,000 years ago. Eh? People were there, living there. Eh? There are footprints of people over there. Eh? So this is the changes that happens in the river because of these changes in the, in the, in the sea level. Hmm? Uh, also, if I put a dam, because we are working now in another uh, river up, uh, up, uh, uh, up north, which is the Colorado River, they build uh, a dam, and the geomorphology of the river upstream of the dam and downstream of the dam changes completely because of the presence of the dam. And what happens is it changed me completely the levels of, of flooding, eh? The, the, the way people will work around this river, cause the water going up and down is being used uh, downstream or upstream of this dam. Eh? Those kind of things are going to be uh, very effective. And so we, well, uh, we are trying to mimic the sea level using the tidal range and how the tidal, tidal propagates into the river. So this is a very complex uh, uh, spectral analysis of the tidal uh, the tidal uh, levels measures in different stations along the river and see how that the tidal, the tidal will propagate along the river. Well, uh, I'm going to finish this part of this morning eh, by taking something that the, the professor, I don't remember the name, of, Stefan, Stefan uh, was saying about monitoring. Yeah? Monitoring is a very important thing. We should have started 200 years ago yeah? because that's what the problem he was pointing out. We lack data. Yeah? We lack data, uh, and I wasn't leading water also. Yeah? But monitoring requires some thinking. It's, I, I don't have to go with... Uh, with an instrument, putting it down over there, and start measuring. Eh? Because it's very expensive. Because monitoring <laughs> means that I have to have a long-term data in many places. Because one station in itself doesn't help. Eh? Because it's, it will not tell me anything. Because, for example, you know how... How is the area of a, of a cloud when it's raining? Eh? It's about six square kilometers. So in six square kilometers on the other side, I will have a completely different rain. Eh? So a station here might show me that it's raining, and 10 kilometers on the other side is not raining. Eh? So what, what, what will help me monitoring in one place and no monitoring over there? Hmm? So I had to think clearly. So there are some things when you d define a monitoring program, you have to think in why. Yeah? Yeah. Monitoring for monitoring by itself doesn't make any sense. No? Why? What to use? What to use means what? instruments I'm going to use. Eh? Because depending on why, I'm going to decide what instruments I'm going to use. If I, I will not monitor the water, the humidity of the sediment if I'm in the middle of the sea. Eh? So that doesn't make any sense. So I have to really think what I'm going to use. Eh? Where is part of the, what I talked to you before. For how long? Eh? which is that's a really, it's extremely 
difficult question. Eh? Because uh, how long it will it, it produce the fact that I need to establish a program that will continue after I'm gone. Mm? So somebody else has to take care of all this data of the instruments eh, after I no longer participate, either because I'm, I'm just close to retirement or those kind of things, but somebody else has to take care of all the stations we have. Eh? So why I did everything if somebody else will not continue? So there's something you have to really take care of those things. Uh, why keep it going? Eh? One thing that happens when you get a, a, I don't know how many of you have a, a grant, but most of, most of you surely work with a professor that had a grant. No? And you know, uh, grants are normally for two, three years, maybe one, maybe a, a, a crazy one for five years, the one we, we have. We have a couple of grants that are five years long, but you have to be old enough to get those, those things. <laughs> and then what happens is uh, none of these grants, I have ever seen a grant, even for the most developed countries, that will pay you for repairing the, the instruments or replacing the instrument. Eh? It's only to buy the instrument. And, and that's, believe me, it's a serious problem when you are monitoring because there is no such thing as the eternal instrument. Everybody, everyone will, will break and everyone will have to be replaced and sometimes you need to go and change it and replace it in the middle because if you don't, if my, my long-term series has to be continuous. That's, that's what it means a monitoring. I need to have a long-term series. I, don't, I don't, cannot have breaks in the middle of the, of, the, of the series. So that's a really complex. This is a, our major, we have a network of, of uh, that's the reason I, I'm talking about this, because I have a, a, a network of monitoring stations, and that is our major problem, hmm? besides going back to the computer. <laughs> And give me the, give me the surprise. Eh? That's what I was. What I do when something breaks. Hmm? Eh? For example, we, in, in the, 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 the the stations we, we we build our own station. All all the instruments we use, we build ourselves. Then what happens is in the old times. Eh? When we don't have real-time data, for example, we, we knew because somebody was telling us, oh, okay, that station was not working, and so we had to get on top of the, of the track and go to that place, maybe 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers, to go get over there, and we didn't have the replacement. Eh? And we had to go back again, dismounted, uh, we didn't know anything. So we started to have uh, real-time data. So we, uh, we keep track of this information in our, in our uh, server, in our institute. Then what happens, we know, well, one of the sensors is not working. Well, at least I go with the, the new sensor to this place, and I can re replace it directly. So I have to, even though my, my trip is not wasted, I don't have to go twice at twice to the same place. Eh? Well, those are the kind of things you have to think eh? when you develop a monitoring system. And the, the major problem, the most important problem that we have is not having the monitoring station. Eh? It's what we do with the data. Eh? Because we pass from those days in which we were once every 15 days, once a month, to take to, to, to uh, submerge one sensor and get the data from that uh, profile in the lake on the estuary. And, and two, having, for example, in our case, 
for the wave data, maybe something like a, uh, what is it about this? Something like a, a 500,000 data points per day. Eh? So terabytes of data. Who's going to analyze that? Who's going to store that data? Eh? How you are managing the data? How you do the quality assessment of that data? It's the, it, maybe this is, it's time to finish, probably. But <laughs> no? Eh? Eh? Eight more minutes. Eight more, that's great. We are finished. Yeah. What they do with the data? That's about, that's a major issue. You have to think about that. Eh? Because now we live in a data, in, in, in a time where big data is the world. And big data is a very important thing to have to consider. And that requires uh, specialized people. Not everybody can really handle big data. Hmm? Uh, and who's going to use the data? That's another question. In the why, eh? You have to think about who is going to use the data. Eh? Because otherwise the data is going to be sitting over there and, no, and, and it's going to be a waste of money and time having all that precious data that, as Stefan said today, we lack. Hmm? But we, can, we have all the capability to do it. Hmm? So, uh, the other question is, what, do we know what we do with the data? Eh? That requires a special training eh? to understand how you manage the data. Because it's not an ANOVA eh? for those, for the biologists. Eh? Eh? It's not an ANOVA analysis to do that. Eh? You have to work with the spectral analysis, with the wavelets, and those kind of things to work with this kind of basic data. And I will give you an example. For example, we have a, a project. It's a, a network of, uh, of uh, st uh, stations in which it's called Pampa Square. Eh? It's, a, it's a monitoring program of uh, lakes in the, in the Buenos Aires province. Actually, we have 200 to 300,000 lakes in this province. Eh? Do you know how many lakes are in the world? Eh? Any idea? One number? More than, uh, larger than uh, uh, one hectare. Eh? <laughs> larger than two million. <laughs> eh? Are more than three, three, 300 million lakes in the world. Eh? So most of the water that is not going to the, to the sea is retaining those lakes. Eh? And we work in the, this in this great uh, precipitation gradient, we have uh, stations from here to here, and and we these are these are lakes that have buoys. We build these buoys. We we build the buoys. Eh? It's, uh, the, these are the first buoys that we built in in South America that are being put in these lakes, and they, they don't like me to show that. Is it going now? Yeah, uh, for example, this is a big change, for example, in between Enzo and uh, in the Enzo times. For example, in La Nina or, or El Nino, look how they change the flooding of the, of the area in this that we are monitoring. Eh? And so we had to do bathymetry. So that's the kind of things that you would do monitoring. Eh? Sapling would bulk with sediments, with portals, with fixed, sens fixed sensors like this. This is in the in the delta of the Paraná, uh, we have, for example, uh, UVs uh, and drones to do all these measurements. Eh? And well, that's a question for long. I don't want to keep going. That's an example of the of the buoys that we build. All the sensors we build, everything, 100% of the buoy is built by us. Uh, but we also have places where we just go every 15 days and take samples. And every uh, uh, once a year to measure fishes, everything is here from the physical processes to the highest biology working this system. And this is a, this is a, the the a buoy that we have in a reservoir. This is the first buoy in Argentina, at least that has a thermistor chain. 
Yeah? It's an array of results. So we can see the, the behavior of the, of, the, of the water column as the, if the thermocline de uh, develop or not. And this is a, after our last uh, este, proud. is the first oceanographic buoy built in Argentina, 100%, which is in the Beagle Channel right now. Yeah? It was put in, the, in, the, in February this year. And this is a, another system that we just put in, in April this year. This is a res reserve in a, in a beach in a Pehuenco area. And, and along this uh, wild system, we have temperature sensors, eh, both in the, in the air and in the sediment, trying to calculate the flux of temperature in the area and, and trying to explain why in this area, which is about 38 in latitude, we have in summer the same temperature you have here in Sao Paulo in Brazil. 23 degrees is the temperature of the water. In a place where the, in, the, in, the, in the continental shelf, in summer the temperature is 18 degrees. So we're trying to explain how the beach will provide what, uh, heat to the, to the water. But also we have uh, Tides and everything, and that's the kind of data you get from the from the system. Well, that's the last one. Okay, questions for the first part. I think I get I make it in the in the right time. Eh? So now all all of you that are sleeping can wake up <laughs> and start uh, asking questions. Eh? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Eh? They have uh, between uh, a meter and uh, four meters mostly. The, so they are very shallow lakes, those ones. The voice is like an arbor zone. Eh, what? Like an arbor or voice zone, your voice. The, the, the voice are not, yeah. but the voice are very, very simple. They are, they are simple. Now, now we are making much simpler than the ones we are over there. They are very, very simple voice. You get all the meteorological data and all the uh, hydrological data. You get temperature, turbidity, uh, water depth, uh, salinity, and you can add any sensor you like, uh, the commercial sensor uh, that we, we, we don't produce. You can connect, for example, a DO sensor. You can plug it directly. No, it's not. It's in the south of Tierra del Fuego, the Canal de Beagle. Beagle Channel. It's a, it's a, it's an, uh, that also have that even that have waves also. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just one interesting point I that that you raised and I find it very very interesting is the the data management part. What you do with the data, and I think that um, the value of those data is that they are uh, freely available available to the public. So, yeah. and um, I wonder if if you. Um, in Argentina have a system where you are putting your data available as well to, to the community or, or are just in, within the research yeah. lab? You, you, uh, our data is uh, freely available in the sense you can go and get into the web page and check the data, both the data for the day, for the moment in which uh, the system connected to the, to the server, or you can see it with the last month yeah. of data and graphics. Uh, of course, the, the data, the, the basic data is, is protected for, for a password, but we can arrange. And this, uh, the, our country has built a system, the Ministry of Science has built uh, a, a series of uh, systems called the, not, uh, the National System of Databases. And there are a national system for marine data, for uh, the biodiversity, for x-rays and everything. So people, uh, at, and we, all the researchers are obliged to put the, our data, at least the metadata, into this database. Yeah. So people can, can see which data you have in this system, and they can contact us 
and we make, yeah. can make an arrangement how we can share the data. Because, yeah, the, the, I, I mean, I come from the, the climate community and touring community and ecology in general, so uh, in some of those data are some more open or less open, but I think it's a general problem in Latin America that to get data is just so difficult. And I think that one way where we can advance loads is by releasing this data to the public and uh, putting this data available to the, in the public, public domain to anyone that can analyze but it. The, but, but the problem here is that you, before putting the data available, you have to do the quality control of, course, yeah. of the data. You cannot put, I, I, I can show you the rough data, but not the, the real process data. That processing the data, it takes a, a, a lot. Just for, just give you an example. For one buoy in one lake, eh, four years of data, it took us two students for a year and a half eh, to get the data right so we can use it. It's one buoy, we have six buoys now, and so you can give you an idea of how difficult uh, uh, is to get the, the right data, the, the, the data cure. Eh? I said, no, not the rough data, because the rough data can, can say anything. But the real data that you can use that to do your, your analysis. It really takes a lot. And this is very complex because you don't get too many software, especially free software, to do that. Yeah, so you have, we have to build our own software, software to do that. And it probably is not very good. Yeah? So that's, that's the kind of things that you need to, to understand when you are analyzing this monitoring thing. Hmm? Any other question? Podemos tomar una pausa. Sí, listo. Vayan, vamos a tomar café. Están muertos. Let's go, let's go to coffee.